my task is to tell you a little bit about the banking, uh, banking situation in Spain. And uh, that's the other fun part about Spain these days, as you know. And uh, you know, it's kind of appropriate that Christine started basically his talk by pointing out the uh, contradictions in the design of the Eurozone. Because one of the things that I want to convey to you is that the actions of the Spanish authorities in this, uh, in this banking crisis in Spain is a reflection of these contradictions in the design of the Eurozone. And they were painfully aware of it, and that's one of the things that uh, explains a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the evolution of the banking crisis in Spain. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, you know, the evolution of private credit in Spain, just to show you a little bit about the magnitude of the problem and what a peculiar thing we've seen in Spain over the last 15 years. Uh, you've never seen a credit bubble like this one. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the structure of the uh, banks in Spain, just to give you an idea of, uh, of uh, where the problem was. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the assets and the liabilities of the different, uh, of the different uh, financial institutions. And then I'm going to talk about policy responses and going forward. So just to give you a, a little bit of a sense of what we're seeing in Spain, uh, you know, what I, this is a plot that, uh, you know, the first time we showed it uh, in, the, in the blog, I believe, uh, we put it for the first time, you know, people were quite surprised to see. We simply took the uh, stock of credit on the uh, asset side of the balance sheets of the credit institutions divided by GDP in order to normalize it. And just basically to show uh, the evolution of this magnitude for the last uh, 40 years or so, since uh, 1974 until uh, 2010, I think is the last time we did this plot. And what you can see is that, uh, you know, with the entrance in the euro, there's been an explosion of credit as a percentage of GDP uh, that, uh, you know, has no historical precedent, at, le at least in the last 20 years. And one could argue that perhaps this is uh, some type of financial deepening that Spain is, uh, that Spain is leading, uh, you know, that is something that is converging to the, la to the level of credit seen in other advanced economies in the, U in the eurozone, but uh, this is not the case. Uh, Eurostat actually does something very nice. It takes all these numbers from the different uh, central banks and provides the same time series for all the uh, countries in the Eurozone. And there you have it for Germany, France, and Italy together with Spain. And that's what you can see is that there's been some convergence between France, Italy, and, and Germany. And Spain was more or less, in terms of this financial deepening, if you want to call, uh, you know, to take this measure of financial deepening as credit over GDP, more or less where France and Italy were, if, uh, if at all a little bit above, it's just that Spain takes off, goes well beyond uh, the level of credit to GDP uh, that we see in these other countries. The reasons why Spain needs credit, as uh, Luis was mentioning, Spain is a country where people own houses. This is how you access uh, housing in Spain is via ownership. The rental market does not exist. So it's a country that is uh, geared towards having uh, uh, a lot of credit flowing in the system, okay? So Spain is a banking economy. Everything, all this credit gets channeled through the bank's balance sheets. And as Luis uh, was pointing out, the most important thing to understand about Spain is that uh, we've seen a kind of a financial revolution in Spain because we have this other sector called the Cajas, you've heard in the news, which are uh, banks with a very peculiar structure, okay? So they are depositing institutions with all the banking activities. Think of them as a bank, okay? They are supervised by the Bank of Spain, so the Bank of Spain is watching over them, making sure these guys are behaving the way they are supposed to be behaving. But for historical reasons, they have a strong political connection. So to a large extent, some, but not all of them, by the way, are dominated by, political, by local political elites, okay? There's a fundamental difference with banks. First is a corporate governance issue that is spring from the fact that these guys don't have shareholders. They are owned by a foundation, and when the crisis starts, there's not even a mechanism to recapitalize the cajas. So should you have a caja that is insolvent, it's not clear to the Bank of Spain how you are actually gonna put capital into the caja. Big problem if you think you're gonna have a solvency issue. Now let me give you one piece of good news. The Bank of Spain and the Spanish authorities have done a phenomenal amount of things over the last uh, three or four years. One of the good things they've done is that the cajas no longer exist. And in fact, some of the data that I'm gonna show you right now is no longer available in the website of the Bank of Spain because as a matter of classification, they're no longer there, okay? So, you know, we've solved a secular problem in Spain, which is precisely the fact that, uh, you know, that we have this political meddling in the credit market in Spain. Then you have the evolution of banks and cajas. I show you assets as well as loans to the private sectors for banks and cajas, banks in green, cajas in red, just basically to show you to what extent basically cajas were eating away the business from the big banks. And as you know, Spain has some phenomenally big banks, very efficient banks. We have monsters like BBVA and Santander, very competitive banks, well run, big uh, retail businesses. But the cajas were being very aggressive at growing their folks. 
with the problems that, as we know well, whenever we see an expansion of this magnitude, comes with that. Okay. What is interesting is what was happening on the liability side. So I show you. I'm going to show you many things about liabilities and, 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 and asset sides. I want to, from the very uh, beginning of this talk, just basically show you something about the liability side of these banks. And this is something that Marcos, in his uh, work early on in the crisis, pointed out, and many other people as well, which is that a lot of these crises have to do with wholesale funding. There you have, essentially, a time series of the liability side of the cajas over the last 50, 60 years, OK? So since uh, early, early 60s. And as you can see, the cajas were very boring banks until the mid-70s. They were basically banks like 19th century banks, funded mostly with deposits. There was a big reform, basically trying to make them more like banks in the mid 70s. They lever up a little bit. They got into trouble right away. They needed, you know, we got into a crisis. Problems got fixed, okay? And then the bubble came and it started leveraging like there's no tomorrow, which is the red line uh, when the bubble got going. Essentially, the Cajas could not generate enough deposits in order to fund uh, the lending activities uh, uh, to the real estate sector. This uh, uh, borrowing, of course, takes the form of wholesale funding. I don't have data on off-balance sheet liabilities and off-balance sheet funding needs. This is simply debt that is publicly traded, okay? Debt bought by some uh, German bank or some French insurance company held in their portfolios that comes due and that needs to be refinanced at a particular date. Now, this is true, by the way, but for all credit institutions. So the Spanish banks, which presumably have better risk management uh, techniques than Cajas, also increased their dependency on wholesale funding over the last 15 years substantially. Okay? So essentially, the bubble brought with it a phenomenal amount of fragility uh, to the liability side of the Spanish banking system. What was taking place on the asset side of these balance sheets? Well, on the left, essentially, you have uh, a plot that uh, uh, Luis just showed you, which are the loans to constructions and real estate developers as a percentage of all the loans uh, issued to, uh, essentially, uh, firms in Spain, okay, for business activities. And as you can see, more or less in the uh, late uh, 90s, it was around 20%, it grows to the north of 45%. So the lending book to businesses of the Spanish credit institutions was biased uh, enormously by the, uh, by the real estate bubble, and you have a classic problem of uh, concentration of risk in the books. If you want to measure the amount of, the total amount of real estate risk in the Spanish credit institutions, that's what you have on the right-hand side. And, probably, and by the way, let me just say from the very beginning that this, I'm probably underestimating the amount of real estate risk in the, uh, in the bank's balance sheets, and I'm happy to uh, say why is, why is that the case, okay? But essentially, if you look historically, I'm showing only you numbers from the, the end of 1998, by then it was around 40%. What I'm doing there is adding up loans to construction companies, loans to real estate developers, and mortgages as a percentage of the entire uh, loan book to the private credit sector. And as you can see, it grew by more than 50%, from 40% of the uh, loan book to more than 60%. Essentially, what you have in Spain is a problem of debt overhang. We have a lot of debt issued in order to fund a real estate bubble and very concentrated risk. Now, let me say from the very beginning uh, about the policy response is this issue of whether we knew about the bubble. We haven't talked about anything else in Spain for the last 10, 15 years, but the bubble. This was the topic of conversation. There was a report from the European Commission in 2003 saying there's a bubble in Spain. The Spanish Vice Prime Minister said that there was a bubble. There were several studies from the Bank of Spain. The 2004 election was a dream for economists because it was an election that rotated around the issue of the bubble, okay? Not only that, I'm, I'm happy to quote here Miguel Sebastián, who is actually a very fine economist, a student of Tom Sire and Nell Wallace, I mean, he's got a PhD, who was going to be the future head of the Prime Minister's Economic Office, and he wrote piece after piece in the press, alerting about the dangers of the bubble. Miguel Ángel Fernández Rodríguez, who became the governor of the Bank of Spain, couldn't stop writing and giving interviews before he became the governor about uh, the problems that the bubble was generating and the long-run consequences to the productivity of the Spanish worker that Luis has emphasized on account of the bubble. So, was there anything done? Yes. So, one of the things, a little bit outside, is, is it, I think it goes back to something that Chris Sims was saying in his talk, is it's, I think the Spanish authorities understood, on both parties, by the way, understood that there were imbalances building in the Spanish economy. 
and it was important to actually accumulate buffers. If you ask a finance minister at some point whether you, know, you could have 40% debt to GDP, he would say, why not 35? Why not 30? Because they understood the public sector and needed to compensate for the enormous amount of leverage that the private sector was accumulating. The Bank of Spain at the same time decided to actually start building provisions on the liability side of the banks via the dynamic provisioning system in order to absorb the initial shock when uh, the uh, bursting of the real estate bubble came. And when the crisis hit, basically there's an addition of 3% of GDP on the liability side of the Spanish banks, around 28 billion euros in order to absorb the initial shock of the bursting of the real estate bubble. And Spain was unique among developed countries in this aspect and did these uh, things against the opposition of, uh, of, uh, of a lot of uh, supervisors, regulators, accounting bodies, and so on. At the same time, we decided to uh, limit the amount of a balance sheet uh, uh, transactions that uh, were going to be allowed, precisely because the Bank of Spain wanted to keep a clear eye on the imbalances building in this balance sheet. Okay? There you have the dynamic evolution of these provisions, this kind of liability uh, buffer that we have to absorb the shocks during this cycle from Jesus Arena at the research department of the Bank of Spain. Now, when the crisis comes, things change a little bit, okay? And, uh, you know, some contradictory ideas dominated the policy response. And the only way I can make sense of what the things that we've seen in Spain is that it's basically governed by three things. First, the taxpayer should not bear the burden of rescuing the banking sector. Second, debt holders should not suffer losses. And here the argument was that there was a lot of fear that imposing losses on debt holders would actually drain liquidity for everyone because the problems on the asset side of the, Spain, of the Spanish banks' balance sheets were so large that people, were, you know, basically were gonna, we're going to be suffering a big adverse selection problem. I don't know if I refinance this bank. This is a bank that is going to enter into bankruptcy and in some losses, I'm going to be stuck with some losses. Okay? And by the way, debt holders of the, whole, you know, of, the, of, the, of the Spanish banks have yet to suffer one euro of loss. Okay, prefers have suffered some losses, but there's not a single loss yet on the bank debt in Spain. And the fair assumption, and the most faithful one in my opinion, is that the system, the banking system in Spain in the aggregate, was solvent. So once you include the ability to recap the retail earnings, everything is fine. And this is always the dream of a central banker, that if I only keep these guys alive for a long, for, for sufficiently long, they will be able to recapitalize themselves. It's an implicit transfer. Okay, because I'm going to be conducting monetary policy in a way to give them a nice yield curve in order to recapitalize themselves. But if I keep them alive for a long time, these guys will be able to survive. Okay? So given the assumptions, what was the strategy and why are we in the mess that we're in? Well, if you think that, uh, you know, the system is solvent and that, you know, there's enough uh, profitability in the system, then just provision against P&L. That would do it. And the strategy of the Bank of Spain has always been, okay, Every time you tell me you have a profit, okay, you're going to provision against it. You tell me, I'm going to zero out your profit and you're going to take a loss on the asset side. The second thing is because you believe that in aggregate the system is solvent, I'm just basically going to merge good and bad financial institutions. Because if I were to put them all in one big balance sheet, they would be solvent, okay? Now, this, you know, this is a horrible idea, okay? Because now an informational problem that you already had, you make it even worse. Okay, and now you are preventing private capital from coming in and refinancing these liabilities. Okay, because now you don't know what you're funding. Okay, and then you're going to basically fund the, some of these mergers via public loans. Okay, as a result, there's been very limited recap efforts, which is basically what you hear every time in the press. Losses are being borne by the Spanish FDIC. Basically, what we're seeing is a socialization of losses among banks. But of course, even before this happened. The first thing that the Spanish cabinet did uh, in the fall of 08 was basically to actually issue a debt guarantee program because we could see that you know, we're going to need assistance from these banks to keep issuing. So they're going to keep issuing debt with a wrapper issued by the Kingdom of Spain. Okay? And it's about 65 billion euros now. Now, very important, and this goes back to, uh, I think uh, Chris Sims talked this, uh, this, uh, at the beginning of this uh, wonderful conference. Throughout, one has the feeling that the authorities felt they did not have an end. Okay, they were completely alone in these problems. All promises were fiscal in nature. Were deposits going to get nervous in case there were substantial losses to the Spanish FDIC, in which case they would run. If losses were to be imposed on debt holders, would the <coughs> liquidity disappear and will the ECB come? If uh, the Spanish SPD created by the state in order to help the banks 
issue massively? Would they convey a signal about the Bank of Spain estimates of the potential losses? Would they compromise the fiscal stability of the sovereign, and so on and so forth, okay? So little by little, because we were trying to avoid doing certain things, there was a slow drift linking in public and private balance sheets, which is, I think, where we are right now, via the debt guarantee program, and now via the LPRO, which, as we can discuss later, I don't know if I'm gonna have time to talk about this, is to some degree uh, a form of public guarantee as well, okay? And at some point, when none of this worked, and you could see that it was not going to work, and I think, I think I'm proud to say the reason I were early on saying, uh, you know, in Spain, this is not going to work, you know, you guys better start taking losses, you know, before it gets too late. Uh, you know, very soon the strategy started rotating around what is that, you know, given that this is what I can fund, this is some of the losses that I'm going to be recognizing rather than recognizing the losses and, you know, figuring out where we're going to be getting the money to, uh, to. So that's a little bit the summary of the policies that we're taking, the guarantee program. It was approved in the fall of 08, it was renewed. This is the first thing the new cabinet did when they came in power at the end of last year. The first thing they did it was to renew the debt guarantee program. There was an overhaul of the banking system to do away with the cajas. We created this SPV to help in the recapitalization, and the Bank of Spain took care of interventions and measures strategies, okay? There you have it for your own uh, um, curiosity, the sequence of events. I'm not gonna talk about this, but they will be available in the slides if you want to have a list of all the things that, by the way, we've been very busy in Spain. You know, it's not for lack of doing things left and right, okay? You know, we don't stop. Every morning we try something different, you know? RBL means a new law. A new law, exactly. So RBL means all the new laws that come about, okay, trying to fix the system. It's just phenomenal fun just to read them, okay? As for the merger strategy, I, I was thinking of how to actually tell you what has happened with the Caja sector. And I just came with this color code, which I think is completely surreal. But it's basically the Bank of Spain trying to mix and all these things and to merge them into one. The one that I want you to keep a focus on is the yellow one, which is Bankia. This is now, you know, when we started, Caja Madrid was around 130, 140 billion euro balance sheet. They merged in order to actually try to create a more stable balance sheet. And of course, what happened is that now we have a systemic institution that is around 320 billion euro balance sheet and that it remains the big systemic problem in Spain. Okay, let me just take one second about credibility because one of the things that is absolutely key to understand a resolution in a monetary union, banking resolution in a monetary union, is that somehow signals are being set with a budget constraint because all the promises are fiscal in nature and you don't have kind of the ability to issue uh, fiat uh, money to make uh, good or nominal promises it's kind of, the signaling problem becomes, in my opinion, very, very difficult, okay? So there was a very difficult inference process for, for investors. You know, was the lack of recognition real? Perhaps the losses were not that big. Perhaps the provisioning was good enough. Was it simply gambling for survival? Look, it's just so big that I cannot recognize it, okay? And if I recognize it, they eventually would compromise the sovereign, okay? Let me give you a little example of this. There are two examples in the slides. One is really marvelous to follow. But this one was the first one, and that's why it's important. It's a small caja. This actually was not a very big caja. I think the balance sheet was 30 billion, something like this. It was intervened by the Bank of Spain in March of 09, okay, after the <coughs> merger fell apart. During the merger, uh, a merger with this other caja, there was a due diligence conducted by a private auditor, which basically discovered a fund, you know, basically an equity gap of 3 billion euros on the numbers of 2008, which immediately meant that where you before thought there was a solvent caja, then now there's an insolvent one. And now you've compromised the credibility of the bank supervisor because perhaps they didn't have a clue of what was going on inside this caja. And NPR ratios jumped from 932 to 14.15 after the, uh, the, uh, the Bank of Spain comes in, does this intervention. By the way, the intervention is funded by the Spanish FDIC and it wipe out, wipes out 90% of the funds of the Spanish FDIC, which makes everyone incredibly nervous. And then there's a sale to another caja, which I'm still trying to figure out how it was done. And I've been looking at this for the last two years. I still don't know where some of the assets of the old caja is. You ask that question, nobody answers, okay? So that tells you this is not good, okay? You know, this issue of credibility, transparency are of the essence, okay? There's a second example there that I'll leave you to. Um, the second thing about credibility is that there was no reduction on the risks on the asset side of the balance sheet, you know? This is the extent of real estate developer uh, loans in the books of the Spanish banks, okay? 
is hovering around 300 billion euro. It peaks actually the second quarter of 2009, and then essentially nothing happens, even though we all know there's a lot of problematic assets there. In darker blue, you actually have the delinquent loans, which sit around 60 billion euros. We all think this is a very low number. This creates a lot of cognitive dissonance among foreign observers. You have this problem, okay, that we believe is largely unrecognized, okay? So the other thing about uh, credibility is basically this kind of provision, you know, basically that is an accounting trick. No new capital flows into the bank to balance sheet. This is one of the things that I, I personally have learned. You know, what the investors or what the market wants to see is new capital coming in to absorb losses. This thing of provisioning against PL, every, doing everything through the income statement, is not good enough. Okay? They want to see new fresh money coming in in the banking system to absorb the losses. Okay? So there were some good things. Okay? It's not that it's all bad. This I want to play for a moment. We've solved some very serious problems in the Spanish banking sector, but clearly we haven't fixed uh, you know, the problem of credibility. Wholesale funding is closed for most of the Spanish banks. To a large extent, we're totally dependent on RTR liquidity. Probably the two big Spanish banks, BBB and Santander, are not. And clearly, there's a phenomenal credit crunch taking place in Spain. New credit is down by 30% in 2011. So, going forward, we first have to address this issue. Here you have the cross sectional estimates of recap needs uh, by several investment banks uh, for the Spanish banking system. The fact that it goes from 40 to 125 billion euros tells you that you have an informational problem. Mm -hmm. You really have, you know, the fact that you know the smart guys in JP Morgan or BBVA, which supposedly are you know well informed because they're in Spain, and UBS deferred by 80 by 8 percent, 8 percentage points of Spain's GDP tells you something about, you know, the extent to which you have been able to clarify these balance sheets. Okay. In the meantime, of course, LPR has come across that basically you have the net lending to Spanish credit institutions by the Bank of Spain. That's basically an accounting artifact. Is the lending gets done through uh, the Bank of Spain. So we are now in the north of 200 billion euros. And now we're deepening the diabolic loop that uh, Ricardo was mentioning in one of the answers to, uh, to the questions. Whereas Spanish banks essentially hold around 150 billion euros of the Spanish treasury in their books, the advent of RTRO has resulted in a further increase of the sovereign risk in the asset side of the bank's balance sheet. Two solutions. As Luis was saying, we cannot do it by ourselves. We have to be imaginative about this. One can do a bad bank alanama. I've proposed this before, and there are some numbers of how much you would need. Or if you want to go, you can actually create several bad banks. There are some experiences of doing it this way. So you can intervene some systemic institutions, create good and bad banks, and that way help private capital flow into the good banks and save some capital that way. But the bottom line is that public capital needs to come in in order to absorb some of these losses in a way that is complementary with private capital. 